Hey everybody, this is Jerry. I have such a special guest. I'm really excited, so I'm gonna show my excitement right now. This is Ross Jeffries, the father of PUA. And also, if you remember from my video where I analyzed the PUA MRA male feminist, that was Ross Jeffries. This is him, and that's how he found me. So, Ross, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, that was a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you had those, you made the glasses cool before they were cool. You had the big Coke glasses, Coke bottle glasses. Well, they, the, I, the lenses were actually thin. It was just the, uh, gold wire frames. This is before laser K, the mm -hmm. laser carotomy. Is that what they call that? LASIK. And mm -hmm. that was just a pipe dream for all us heavy <laughs> glasses wearing boys. Exactly. So but, let's, know, they were fun. let's get into that um, talk show because I think a lot of my audience is interested in your behind the scenes view. How did you get contacted? Why did you decide to go on that Faith Daniel show? Well, that was one, that was a minor show compared to the major shows that I had done. What happened was that I had published my book, self-published, How to Get the Women You Desire Into Bed, which, by the way, we'll circle back when we start talking about MGTOW, because there's some MGTOW ideas in there back in 1988. So I don't want anyone to accuse me of um, deifying women or putting them up on a pedestal, because I certainly don't, and I've been saying these things for 30 years. However... Mm -hmm. I had been selling my book in the back of men's magazines through some ads who were quite successful, but I was spending all the money that I was making. So I figured, let's get some free publicity. And I put an ad in a magazine called Radio TV Interview Report. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time, RTIR was the Bible. If you were a radio or talk show producer, you had that thing on your desk. That was the way you found guests. So I wrote a little ad that said, women hate nice guys, says sex book author. Interview the man who turns wimps and geeks into supercharged macho studs. So the Monday morning it ran, I got a call from the Donahue show, which you won't remember, but Donahue was like the number one talk show in the world. And then it just rolled on and on and on. Now, here's the story behind Faith Daniels. The, first of all, you need to understand that TV talk show producers are human scum. They're people <laughs> who didn't have the guts to be a child molester and couldn't make it in the mafia. They are the worst human beings. They'll lie and say anything to get a guest on the show. Mm -hmm. So I went on the show and the producers thought it was a big deal. And then they bring me out. We're backstage and I meet this Mel guy. By the way, it's Mel Fight, not Fight. Mel. Okay. And this Bruce Weinstein guy. And then they bring us out on stage and this producer has a shit eating grin like, look, it's all women. <laughs> and my thought was, no, 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 no. I'm not trapped in here with you. You're trapped in here with me. And I knew I owned every, I think of all, listen, if my attitude going in is I'm smarter than everyone in that room, no matter what show I did, they're all contemptible bitches, whether they're male or female, and I'm going to treat them like my bitch, because I know it was actually to my advantage. Every time I said something that infuriated the women, the men in TV land, most of those shows are geared towards women anyway, so I knew I was going to lose three-fourths of my audience. But the fourth of the audience that were male, the more those women yelled at me, the more those guys would think he's got to have something because all these women are so upset. So it was my deliberate strategy to provoke. And I grew up in a family where we were all champion debaters. So I, not formally, but we had to get attention at the dinner table. It's a big Jewish family. And my older siblings were pretty smart. So I, they're, all my siblings are smart. So I had to learn to out debate them and duck and dive and dodge. And you see, I commanded no matter what they threw at me, I quote, held my frame. Yeah. What I really liked about it was compared to Mel and compared to Bruce, Bruce was very just trying to pander. Mel was very angry. You were very calm and collected. That was the major difference between the three people who were, who were the panelists, so to speak. I call this technique spocking after Mr. Spock from Star Trek. So the angrier people get, the cooler I become. And the more I say like, so if someone's spraying hate at me, call me a motherfucking sexist pig and I, you should be shot and pissed on, which I've someone said on the show. Uh, my attitude is, my response is so like, what are you trying to say? And that just infuriates them more. Mm -hmm. And the more infuriated they get, the more in the back of my mind I'm going, ha ha ha, I got your ass. Yeah. And one thing that I really liked about that interview is it also showed 
a lot of times when people are getting really angry at you, it's cognitive dissonance. It's their emotions kicking in because deep down at heart, they know you're right. So the fact that the audience and all the women were getting really angry shows you hit something in them deep down at heart. They're like, oh, I have to not, I have to not admit this. I have to use my emotions to cover this up. Jerry, I think that's part of it. But the other part of it is they're being provoked to think in ways that they don't want to think. Mm -hmm. People don't like being thrown off their pins, to use a metaphor. Mm -hmm. And so the other thing is they get so angry, they think they're hearing something that I'm not actually saying. Yeah, yeah. And so these are all strategies that were designed. I, I like to provoke people. It was mm -hmm. fun for me. That was my role in my family way earlier than this, before I met <laughs> Jeffries, way earlier. Mm -hmm. There was a TV talk show called Wally George. You won't remember Wally mm -hmm. George. Wally George was a syndicated TV talk show during the 80s. And he was this uh, idiotic, moronic, right-wing moron during the days of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> would say, get out of America, you gays. And, you... and so I figured, I'm going to tweak this guy. So I said... No, I, I thought, I'm going to call up the producer and say I'm a conservative for Satan. That I worship Satan, but I believe in great conservative values because Satan is the ultimate conservative. They had me on that show, and the audience literally wanted to tear me to pieces, <laughs> laughing my ass off inside. <laughs> Billy to laugh on the inside, but keep a straight face. What makes for good comedy, if you've ever seen these shows – one of, some of my favorite movies are Airplane and Naked Gun, and they hire the genius of these guys, the producers, the Abrams brothers, is they hired dramatic actors, not comedians. And so Leslie Nielsen would deliver a crazy line, but completely straight face. Like when the woman with huge tits says, is this some kind of bust? And he said, yes, they're quite impressive. That's funny, but if you said, yeah, they're impressive, it's not funny. Exactly. What I found through my comedy training, and I was a very bad comedy writer and uh, improv comic, not good. I did learn, my comedy writing teacher taught me, you can do the craziest situations if you start out small and also you play it straight. So that was my technique for going on all these shows. Wow. So did you end up keeping in touch with Bruce or Mel after the talk? No. Oh, no. Why would I? No. Oh. They were just one of many, two of many, many faces I saw as a, as guests on all these shows. Mm -hmm. I always dominated all the shows I went on. I made everyone my bitch. I took up 80%. I remember a show where I, during the break, I said, leaned over. I said, you've got to say something. You've been quiet the whole show. Jump in. Wow. Yeah, I just... No the reason I the reason I asked that question is because, like I said in my video when I was analyzing the talk, even though Mel didn't communicate well, I feel like him and you really had a lot that you guys could have agreed on. It's just you know he went he went about it not correctly. So that's why I thought maybe maybe you guys could have like connected and maybe I did something. So. You don't think so? I don't think so. No. Mm -hmm. Well, and do you have any information on that Bruce dude? I just like that Bruce dude. It's just it's like such so obvious, and he was so wooden. Like, yeah. like man, should give up their power. Yeah. Uh, no, I think he was just. I don't think he believed all of what he said. He was trying to get some attention for his organization. Uh, I hope for his sake he didn't believe it. If he did, he's a lost cause. Yeah, exactly. Because but, but, I was trying to do research on him, and I, I think he like dropped all the feminism stuff. I believe now he's like a corporate consultant or something I, like that. What I would say is, I, you, and this is going to rile up your audience, but I don't give a fuck. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone who wants to call me a man China or a white knight or label me is not pausing to look at the nuance of my thinking. Mm -hmm. Labels tend to take away all the nuance and the complexity of human behavior. Mm -hmm. And so you have to understand when it comes to certain things, I'll back up a step. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a family where the women were, are the, my sisters are quite successful, very successful. No one handed it to them. They had to earn it. Literally, they had to earn it. My sister Marion is a multimillionaire in real estate. And she runs a psychological services company that brings in millions of dollars. She runs that business. Her husband doesn't know jack shit about it. Uh, my, my other sister is an entertainment lawyer. Wow. And for a while, she ran her own TV and movie TV production company with her then husband. But So 
my own personal examples don't show me women who are lazy and who don't want to work. My own personal example, and my sisters both have children. My sister, who's the entertainment lawyer, her kid is super successful entrepreneur, made it all on her own. Wow. So this view that women don't want to work, women are stupid, it's not from my personal experience. My personal experience is, and with not all, but some of the women I've dated, it's not true. So when I hear things like AWOL, all women are always like that, or all women, oh, I immediately know first from personal experience that I have counterexamples to that. And then I also know it's, a sl it's sloppy thinking. People don't want to go through the nuance and the complexity that getting good data and a good uh, accurate worldview require. Because when it comes to human behavior, humans are complex, they're chaotic, they're nuanced, they're contradictory, and everything they do is in a certain context. So this is one of the big problems I have with uh, MGTOW and Red Pill, is that there's a lot of truth in there, but the truth is mixed in with a lot of sloppy thinking, mythology. And I thought about this interview, and, and my summary of MGTOW is the Doors song, and there's a line, women seem wicked when you're unwanted. And uh, so it seems to me these are some of the things I'd like to bring up and, and talk to you about. It. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, I would say the, the first thing I would say is that I think there is some, like, like I mentioned to you in the, in the response to your comment, there are maybe some people who identify as MGTOW who really they just do it because they're trying to justify the fact that women don't find them attractive. But from my interactions with Big Tao, I think a lot of the people, at least that watch my channel, they've been, let's say, screwed over in relationships or maybe divorce court or something like that, messed them up. So they're, it's not like they weren't wanted, like they were wanted enough, they got married or you know they had relationships, but either the laws or the cultural norms or whatever caused them to come out on bottom. So that's what I would say about a lot of MGTOW. That, that, that goes into why a lot of them are potentially very angry, and maybe they're angry at people like you for teaching men, oh, yeah, this is how you get women. Life has disappointing experiences. Mm -hmm. We all at some point get injured or damaged. I am not in any way saying that divorce or family law should not be changed. I have a good friend who's a family law attorney. He said to me, if you ever – thinking of get married, which I've never thought, you're going to walk the halls of family court with me for a day and see what goes on. And he now calls it the weaponization of family court. So I am not by any means sane. But then that to go jump from that conclusion to saying that women are evil or wicked is we don't know why divorces happen. Sometimes divorces happen because couples just grow apart. They just start out in one way and they grow apart. Um, we don't know that she dumped you because she's a uh, practicing hypergamy. Maybe she dumped you because you're a lousy lover or have a drinking problem or beat her up. Maybe you cheated on her so she dumped you. Again, these aspects of human behavior are nuanced, have multiple inputs, and a lot of people, when they're in pain, don't want to look at how they contributed to the situation. It's plain and simple. And I understand when you're, I've been, believe me, I've been fucked over in business and other things. You can view the world through a bitter lens or you can stop and say, okay, here's the real lesson to draw from it. What can I do next time to make, to at least do my best to ensure it doesn't happen again? There's no guarantees with human behavior. I think looking for guarantees with human behavior is going to get you into mischief. It's going to lead to radical ideology it's going to lead to poisoning the well of who you are i'm not saying that people don't get fucked over that would be contrary to observable reality i'm simply saying that oftentimes <clears throat> when something like a marriage ends there's multiple reasons for that mm -hmm. it's not just that the woman is seeking a guy of higher status which seems to be the only explanation that migtow is giving she wants someone of higher status or someone who's more alpha than I. Who knows? Maybe you beat her up. Maybe you come home drunk. Maybe you just don't fucking listen to her. There's a lot of inputs 
to these kind of things. Human relationships are very complex. You have other people's old behavior patterns. I had a yoga teacher who said, romantic love brings up for examination everything that's not loved. And so if you don't think that's true, then you've never really been involved in a, in a relationship. Mm -hmm. This is all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think if someone were to argue another MGTOW point, maybe they would say something like this. They would say, so whether you, you take economics or whatever, you look at opportunity cost. So you look at the, the amount of time, the amount of effort it would take someone to learn to be more confident, get their attitude right, get all the preconditions necessary to attract a woman. And all that effort, you could do something else with it. So I think that's, that's an another I, common or, argument for that's big an, town. Well, that's an, first of all, that's an either or argument that you either do one thing or another. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of striking a balance. They mm -hmm. don't have to be mutually exclusive. And I don't think it takes that much. It takes effort, but it doesn't have to be struggle if you know what you're doing. There's no doubt about it. It can be a big pain in the ass to, to learn to approach and a pain in the ass to manage frustration and manage confusion. The real issue is not so much time control as managing the frustration and the confusion that comes when you're dealing with someone as complex as, as women and as chaotic as women. So they're, they're assuming it's either or, that you can't do both. And I'm saying that's not true. You can do both. You absolutely can do both. And nor should one be done to the, nor does one have to be done to the exclusion of others. Other. I have no problem. In fact, I encourage guys, go out. Find a passion that you're devoted to. Find a sense of contribution. I call them the three C's. What are you constructing? What are you creating? What are you working on in your life? You're, where are you finding your sense of contribution to something larger than yourself? And then number three, your cravings. Are your cravings good for you or bad for you? Yeah. So yeah. do you understand my answer that I think that either or choice is just not true? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, it's, and like you said, a lot of it probably is the sample size. I think many of us have had stories of people who've gone so deep into the PUA and they don't seem to see that it's a balance. And so, and those people tend to be the ones that we remember when we, at least me, when I, when I think about friends who got into PUA, those are the ones I remember, the people who never even learned how to talk like you and I are talking, but they're approaching girls or they're going into bars trying to talk to people and they're doing it so much. So, so like, but I, I, a lot of those people, thank you. I'm sorry. I'll mm -hmm. continue and then I'll continue. Mm -hmm, sure. Um, but yeah, um, basically, basically my point, my point was made already. It's just a lot of times when we think of examples, we tend to think of the most extreme examples and we sometimes forget there are people who strike a balance. That's my problem with MGTOW. It's a form of extremist thinking. I have a problem with any form of extremist thinking, whether it's communism, conservatism, Zionism. I mean, I happen to support the state of Israel, but when it goes to the extent where all of the lands between the Euphrates and the Nile belong to us, I go, no, that's extremist. Because I'm going to say it again and repeat it till I'm blue in the face. And the listeners think I'm being, uh, are tired of hearing it. Human behavior is nuanced, complex, chaotic, contradictory. And, and that's just how it goes. But Circling back to this point of guys who can't, who, who are just obsessed with it and get nowhere, I would say 20 to 30 percent of the people who come to the community have some form of Asperger's. Mm -hmm. They can't even talk. They cannot process a normal human emotion, normal human conversation. They don't know how to read signals. They can't even have a comfortable conversation with a man. And I would be willing to bet there's a chunk. I don't know. I, Bless their hearts. I do my best to work with those guys, and sometimes I can help them. Sometimes I can't. But I think it would, if you want to take a good, honest look at yourself, there's a big chunk. Not you, but I'm speaking to editorial you. There's a big chunk of MGTOW who I think are, are Asperger. They're just frustrated that they can't form any kind of relationships with anyone. It goes all the way to the extreme of this turd flinging monkey dude who promotes uh, getting love dolls. If one of his advertisers is getting uh, realistic love dolls. So if your choice is fucking a piece of plastic or learning human 
skills to, to meet that we all have in ingrained needs for human connection and for touch and for sex it's to deny it and say no it's too much work uh or i'm not going to meet that need i'll just go without it is insane and i can give a very funny example so i was yesterday i was at this little meetup where i was practicing mandarin with with some chinese people and there was one girl she's been living in Japan for 16 years. So she was telling me to the extent of how bad it is in Japan. Like people there are so introverted. They don't know how to interact. Like social skills are like non-existent in Japan. She says like, guys just like follow you to your home. And then maybe as you're going into your door, they'll be like, hey, do you want to get a drink with me? It's like that level of bad. So, um, you know, I'm just giving that example because I hope our society doesn't become like that. I think what we see is a distorted reading of an inadequate sampling. Mm -hmm. Look, uh, when people get to extremist views like MGTOW or Red Pill, they're looking at a, a distorted view of an inadequate sampling. However, Red Pill, I tend to lean more towards saying they've got some serious good points. I think they distort. Uh, I personally think guys like Rolo Tomasi are – total Asperger, the way they write, the way they think. I was going to debate him, do a podcast debate at 21 convention. He backed out the last minute. Oh, wow. Dude, tell me about the 21 convention. I've heard a lot about it, but I don't know much about it. Uh, I don't prefer, I, you know, I'm not going to offer a narrative mm -hmm. of it, except that I participated. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I was welcomed. Uh, and people should check that out on their own. It's not of interest to me to talk about it. Okay, sure. The the thing I wanted to mention about so you talk about MGTOW and Asperger's I think even Sandman um have you ever seen Sandman's channel? Uh. So even he admits that he has some Asperger's. So and I do think you're probably right that maybe twenty percent of people who identify as MGTOW probably do have some Asperger's or some some mild autism or something. Right. So. It, I think with any of these communities that tries to understand human behavior, it's like if you really understood human behavior, you wouldn't be part of these communities or if it came naturally to you. So sometimes, especially for people who are very rational, who overthink things, who don't think on an emotional level or aren't capable of it because of right. certain conditions, you just have to join these communities where you try to rationalize and break down things in a different way, usually logically, which is what I think MGTOW, Huey, Red Pill tried to do. I think you're right. Again, there's nothing, not only is there nothing wrong with looking for patterns of behavior, we can't not do it. Where mm -hmm. Our brains are pattern-making machines. That's how we've evolved. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm going to say this again. It's like I say in my seminars, when I teach and what I taught at 21 Convention, because I didn't speak, I taught. There's a distinction between them. Mm -hmm. I always say what I'm about to tell you is not true with a capital T and there's no there's no science it's not science it's only my map my model of how things work based on my observation and the work of myself and thousands of students which I really can claim with no marketing after 30 years of doing this and it's subject to error it's certainly subject to improvement it's incomplete and I welcome improvements to it. Mm -hmm. It's so my approach is not authoritarian. It's authoritative. I will present as an authority, but I'm not authoritarian. And what I find over and over and over again is that streak of authoritarianism. That, and the confusing thing is, it's mixed in with real stuff. When people in Red Pill or or MGTOW or something say, "Look, women, women play these games. They do these mind fucks." There's some truth to that. There may be a large amount of truth to that. What they're not seeing is that men do it too. We do it too. It's human nature to be, I'm going to use a big word, duplicitous, to be sneaky. It's called the theory of mind. You know about theory of mind, don't you? No, tell me. Was that a woman who just walked by? Yeah. Introduce her. <laughs> <Very> <laughs> well, that. later, if she comes by again. Is that your lady? No, no, it's not. Um, I work in a building that has a lot of startups, so they are here all the time on the weekends. Okay. All right. Uh, what, where was I? She theory of mind. 
theory of mind. Uh, you know, theory of mind. When kids kids reach a certain age, when they're still very young, where they can go, oh, I, I know what that. If I say this, that person will think this. So I'll, that's when kids first learn to lie. They go, oh, if I say this, then mommy will think that. And she might say this, but then I'll know what to say about that. Children early on, Google it. Theory yeah, I'm looking mind. at it right now. Yeah, so you see what I'm saying? That's not just females, that's males. Oh, and I'm just going to read a passage right now. For kids with developmental delays such as autism spectrum disorders, theory of mind may take a little longer to develop, and some higher level skills may not be reached at all. Very interesting. Now, does it say what theory of mind is? Yes, it does. Um, okay. it, has the, it has the core concepts on top. Basically, it involves understanding another person's beliefs, knowledge, emotions, and intentions, and then using that to navigate social situations. And at what age does it say that children first begin to develop this? Uh, let's look at this. About four. That's what, yeah. that's what psychology today so that's says. Why, that's why little kids, younger kids will lie and they don't even understand that they're lying. They don't get it. You understand? Mm -hmm. But sophisticated lying starts when you're four. Now, does it anywhere say that only females do this? Mm -mm, not at all. It's human. It's mm -hmm. like trying, what bothers me is mixed in with the truth and the good points of Red Pill and MGCAL is demonizing an entire gender. They're demonizing the feminine gender to deify the masculine gender. I went to 21 convention and no one talked about uh, at all about the fact that men can act this way too. And the, I heard someone say, fuck it, the organizers say, the fate of Western civilization rests on your shoulders. Feminism is a cancer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He believes that. I think there are a lot more problems for Western civilization than that. So I am really cautious and even anxious when I'm presented with extremism because mm -hmm. over and over and over and over and over I see that human beings are extremely chaotic and nuanced and it's lazy thinking or just incapable of grasping it's either an unwillingness or a incapacity to grasp nuanced and complex and, and sometimes contradictory ideas and this is an example I give on my channel a lot. I, I tell my viewers this, but one time I brought on a couple. They're a couple that I've worked with in the past, and they're both creatives, and they have a production company together. So I talked to them. I talked about, about the relationship, about how their relationship works, and every comment was like, oh, fuck the lady. <laughs> they what got, was they, comment was what? Every comment was like, fuck this lady. Oh, this lady walks over the guy. Basically talking smack about the lady, the lady and the couple, and they the couple got so just sad about it. They're like Jerry, can you please take down the video? I'm like, sure, that's fine. You guys came and did my video, thank you, and I don't want you guys to. And I'm wait sure, I'm I have no doubt that 90% of the comments on this episode will be, look at that old fart, look at that senile fuck. Uh, Ross Jeffries has turned into a pussy. Ross Jeffries, it, it will be nothing but personal insults. I I would challenge anyone who doesn't like what I'm saying to talk about what it is I'm saying rather than hurling an insult at me. But I don't think these people are capable of that. They're just not. They're not capable. It's like asking someone who's blind to describe a rainbow. They can't do it. So I just feel pity for them and... Uh, and that's that's it. So I think my last question would be, so, you know, a lot of the people, including you said the 21 convention, they were like, "Ooh, feminism is the cancer. You got to that's going to destroy Western society. What do you think are some other things that Western society needs to look at if you don't think feminism is sort of the number one cancer or whatever? <laughs> you really want to get into it. Yeah, huh? yeah, I'm really curious what your views are. All right. Again, these are just my ideas. Mm -hmm. They could be wrong. They're subject. To, uh, it's they're subject to change, and they're incomplete. And I'll tell you, I don't say I know things. I will say I suspect, or it seems likely to me. 
Mm -hmm. It seems likely to me that at least in the United States, our democracy is pretty much a sham that the power centers, the real power centers in the United States are the national security state, the national security apparatus. That's all the three letter agencies and plus probably some that we don't even know. You know, the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office was not even, it even existed until something like 15 years ago. Yeah. Uh, I believe it's the national security apparatus the military industrial complex, and if you think I'm being crazy, Eisenhower, when he gave his retirement speech, said, beware the military industrial complex. So the military industrial complex, big finance, we're talking about those banks that were bailed out, bailed out do you understand? Yep. This is going to sound like crazy conspiracy, but Federal Reserve and fiat currency, uh, big pharma, and uh, big energy, and then big agriculture. Basically, big money runs the show. And I think what you're seeing is a need for perpetual war. We're always looking for an enemy so we can fuel the war machine and, and make money. This is really going to get me into trouble. And I'm not a pacifist by any means. Sometimes you have to fight. But I think if you look at the history of the United States, there's a book called Addicted to War sort of like a booklet made it with a book that makes a lot of sense to me. And essentially, it, we can't stop fighting people. Look at how many, we have bases in over 100 countries. How many people are we uh, bombing right now? We're bombing in Syria. We're bombing Afghanistan. We're bombing in, um, we're supporting airstrikes in Yemen. We're all over the fucking place. So I think this is... Um, uh, this is a big threat. I think um, how the United States is running on debt. Sooner or later, that debt bubble is going to burst, and it's not going to be the big boys that pay it. We're going to have to pay it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's the aliens. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ross, what is next for you? Are you going to appear on talk shows again? Are you going to write more books? Well, what's next for me is I've written a book it's getting five star ratings on Amazon. We got one hater mm -hmm. who said this book is confusing. I'm throwing it right in the trash. <coughs> I love haters. The book is called Subtle Words That Sell. Mm -hmm. How to get your prospects to convince themselves to buy without pushing, pressuring, or pitching. Mm -hmm. And it's everything I've learned over the course of teaching NLP and NLP-like stuff applied to selling. It's a batshit crazy completely different way of looking at all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, and now uh, what I'm doing now is I'm beginning to get on stages talking about this and teaching about this. Mm -hmm. It seems, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the Amazon reviews right now. It seems like once you start applying the psychology, all the th all your learnings to something what more general than just read, seduction. Read, read. Yeah, read a couple of these Amazon reviews. Yeah, I, I'm saying that uh, it seems like when you're applying them to more general than just seduction, people start hating on it less. Just because I'm looking at the Amazon, like if you look at some of your other books, there's a lot more negative comments. Yeah, but, but what did, read one. Read a good sure. one. Sure. So I'm going to, this person named Gene Home said, um, absolutely unstoppable persuasion techniques. So... She says, I guess it's a she, she says, I've been in sales for 10 years. I started selling investments as a broker and eventually left the field and began working in the advertisement industry. In the last five years, I've been using some of the persuasion training of Ross Jeffries and the results have been absolutely incredible. That's enough. We don't have to go into <laughs> but, So uh, this is what I really want to do. And I'm done. Uh, I put in 30 years helping being the messiah to guys who were essentially hopeless. It, mm -hmm. it basically wore me to a frazzle. I'm required by an agreement I made with my students in my group coaching thing to give a seminar in London. I don't want to do it because I'm done with it. But I'm essentially, I really, I retired once before, but now I have something I'm excited about that I really want to move on to. So mm -hmm. I mean it when I say uh, I, I'm done. I put in my time and uh, they're just... 
it's just after 30 years, it gets wearisome to talk about, to see the same person wearing a different face. <laughs> I, yeah, I know what you mean. And I don't get the, you know, I can't be people's superhero. And having to deal with people with tremendous emotional problems is exhausting compared to teaching professionals where it's not my job to fix deep emotional problems. I'm teaching them the inner game of selling, but also persuasion techniques. It's so much easier, and there's a lot more money in it, and it's something that I can get excited about again. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, too bad I haven't trained up anyone to step into my shoes, but that's a little sad, but that's the way it goes. Yeah, and as long as you have the books out there, I think people will synthesize your knowledge. I mean, that's what a lot of the PUAs did. They took some of your knowledge. They tried to add their own things. Oh, you think? Oh, oh, yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. What do you – I mean, okay, I'm, I'm not going to go into specific people, do but do you think the PUA movement has moved in the right direction? Do you think it's moved in the wrong direction? I, that's an either or, or, of course. But like, I don't care. You know, I used to spend a lot of time hating on them and, and – that was my own deeply rooted pattern that I learned in my family to make other people wrong. It's something by the grace of my meditation practice I've profoundly diminished. It's still there, but much less. I would, uh, to some extent, I wish I had done it. The other extent was necessary because these guys really were ripping people off. Mm -hmm. I don't care what other people do. I haven't talked about it in years. I keep my blinders on, my head down. I do what's important to me in my life and my work, and I don't care. I, one thing I will say is the bar to entry got lowered 10 years ago when anyone could set up a website and a YouTube channel and proclaim themselves a guru. I do feel stirred up in an uncomfortable way when I look at some of what my former students have moved on to. There was a guy who used to train with me. I welcomed him into my fold. He was a student for a long time. I let him get up on stage and he turned around and he had always wanted to be a star. And what happened is he began to get his own groupies within my business and getting that adulation being, this is something I would like to talk about being admired like that kicked in some seed of narcissism and craziness. And he began, he went from being someone who dressed in a suit and a tie. He grew a mohawk. He started uh, doing drugs and, fucking strippers and eventually he started his own business and he went bananas he's now so floridly manic if you look at him I won't mention names uh, and he's turning around and poisoning other people with his nonsense so I sometimes do feel bad it's like Frankenstein in the story of Frankenstein Frankenstein is not the monster Frankenstein is the doctor who created the monster mm -hmm. and I think to some extent I've spawned monsters and who and I don't know that that karma, I think that karma is balanced out by all the good I've done. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think this business does have a lot of sociopaths and psychopaths who, one of the reasons, among others, I never set up a business model where there were boot camps running all over the world every weekend, is I knew I couldn't duplicate myself. So some of these companies who have these business models like that, They'll make anyone a trainer. Usually someone who takes their class and pays them a, a fee <coughs> can be a trainer. I've had so many students over the years come to me and say, God, this training it ruined me. They just shamed me into approaching women. And, and that's I can't say it's criminal, but it, I think these people know that it's fraudulent. They know they're not helping people. And I used to think it's my job to shut them down, but mm -hmm. yeah caveat emptor man i don't have the energy anymore mm -hmm. and i remember about five years ago in that account that you reached out to my channel on i remember the first video you put up where you were you were like oh look at this website it's like the way it's pitching its product i still remember that video i was like oh i i've, I've seen his channel before and so i remember that you what about it back then in a pretty funny way you're like oh look at this look at how he's trying to sell it's too funny so I'm going to be 60 years old. I don't have the energy to waste my time on things that are not adding value to my life mm -hmm. and value to the life of the people who I love. Yeah, exactly. So why don't we talk a little bit about Magnolia, the movie, since sure. they based that character that Tom Cruise portrayed on you. I will not apologize for who I am. Right on. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. 
I will not apologize for what I need. I will not apologize for what I want. How did you get hooked up with them and how did they I decide? Didn't. Oh, you didn't. I found out through someone who read the trades or something. I don't remember exactly how it came to me that Tom Cruise was going to be doing this character based on me. So I went to see it with my intellectual property attorney, Janine Hayes, who I had a big crush on, but Janine would not go out with me because I was a client. So I said, okay, Janine, now you have to go out with me. This is protecting my intellectual property. We, you're, you're, we're going to the movies. And when Tom Cruise came out in that scene, I fell over laughing because they obviously had taken things from my original book, like how to fake like you're a kind and loving person. Uh, I have a chapter in the original book, how to fake like you're warm and friendly. So they took things and then they took things. And you look at the movie, uh, uh, for a while, early on in my career, I had um, uh, a guy who was a PhD, so we called him Dr. X. I don't want to mention his name. And then we had a guy named Major Mark. And so in the movie, when the reporter comes in, she said, uh, this is Captain Muffy. I'm uh, right, Major so they were clearly taken from me. I never heard from them, never heard a thing. They never contacted me, ever. But man, it gave me great publicity to this day. So my, my shtick now is to say, I'm Ross Jeffries. They call me the wizard of subtle words itself. And I teach entrepreneurs, business people, professionals, corporations, how to get your prospects to convince themselves to buy without pushing, pressuring, or pitching. Now let me, tell you a little bit of a story that illustrates what makes me uniquely qualified to teach this subject. Many people don't know this, but Tom Cruise played me in the movie Magnolia, and that's because the director and writer of that film discovered that I'm considered to be the worldwide authority on taking socially clueless, lonely guys and teaching them how to hold subtle conversations that make them genuinely charming and attract some amazing women. Now, if I can take a guy with no social experience, totally tongue-tied, show him how to use his words to sell himself on uh, a date with the most amazing woman, I can take you successful, intelligent, professional people, show you how to use your own subtle words to get your prospects to buy, convert, clothes piece of cake to do that so I'm actually spinning it using the whole Tom Cruise thing and also when you say Tom Cruise played this guy in a movie come to the talk people come yeah, yeah. so um, going along that line then what did you think about how Neil Strauss portrayed you in the game because my impression he seemed to portray you kind of a little angry you know oh Ross Jeffries was angry at this PUA for stealing his stuff kind of well, I was. That's accurate. Mm -hmm. But that's not all I was. I was also extremely generous and kind to Neil and gave him a lot of my time and mm -hmm. a lot of uh, good advice, which he never mentioned. So, yes, I was angry at that time. Very angry and even envious and bitter. I'm not going to sugarcoat who I was, mm -hmm. nor will I sugarcoat who I am then. And um, these are, I'll show you like one of the most important things in my life. Mm -hmm. oh. Can you, do you know what this is? Um, a, is that a neck pillow? No, it's not. What is it's that? Tell me. Cushion. It's a what cushion? Sorry. Meditation cushion. Oh, sit. okay. Yeah. So I've had to purge these deep, I hate the word spiritual, spiritual poisons of envy resentment, despair, uh, all of these things that were so infecting my personality. Mm -hmm. And I acknowledge them that, that that's what it was. I'm not totally purged of it. It comes up from time to time from, I think it's based in a extraordinarily, extraordinarily traumatic childhood. I won't go into details, but I come from some pretty profound trauma. I think it would have killed other people. Wow. And uh, a family background of depression and anxiety and bipolar and all this other stuff. So this has been a tremendously good tool for me to purge myself. But I had no practice like that back then. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it was a, I was doing it. Or I took so much delight in it, I couldn't stop doing it. 
So I'm taking, I'm being very vulnerable here and, and mm -hmm. letting you see the human behind the whole thing. So Neil, I think, was not fair in that that was the only part he portrayed. He didn't portray, and he was there to see it multiple times, how much I genuinely cared for my students. Deep devotion to my students. He never talked about that. He's a smart guy. He knows how to observe. He was there. He, all he mentioned was that I asked in the seminar, who's your one true guru? And he wouldn't, you know. He never once, not one time, mentioned that I was deeply devoted to the students and took great care to answer. He, he didn't mention that. Mm -hmm. He also said things about me that weren't true, that I was greasy, uh, that my skin is greasy, which is ridiculous. It's the other side of the cover. I'm, uh, and he called my students, he attacked my students. He called them greasy losers and fools. And I called him on it. I was furious with him about that. He said, yeah, you know, that was unfair. If, when the book comes out in paperback, if he does, I'll change that, which is his bullshit. I mean, he had no intention to change it. So I think when he talked about me being bitter and angry, that's true. But he also, in the same part of the never talked about the devotion I have to my students. He didn't talk about that. He gave me credit for single-handedly having created this whole thing. He gave me credit for that. I, so I would say his portrayal was unbalanced, but what he did cover was true. Mm -hmm. I see. And it goes back to what we, we've been talking about this whole conversation about people like to think in extremes, right? They like to fit people into one peg. He's this, he's that. It's easy. It's, yeah. it's lazy. It's easy and lazy, and it removes the the need for any doubt or nuance. Yeah, and I, that's why I really appreciate you, you know, sharing some of these vulnerable things. I think it really puts you in a different light than what I've, I've ever read through, about. I've been through excruciatingly painful circumstances mm -hmm. in my life that easily would have caused other people to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I have struggled and battled with depression. Thank goodness. Not so much anymore, nearly as much. I've been doing some revolutionary treatments uh, mm -hmm. called direct neurofeedback. But mm -hmm. in any case, I'm a deeply flawed human being. Mm -hmm. Many flaws. But not caring about my students isn't one of them. Mm -hmm. That's not one of them. Yeah, exactly. So he didn't cover that. And he also, just some other things. Neil didn't tell us he was writing a book. Oh. Pretended he was gonna. He was everyone's friend. Do you understand? And to that extent, he betrayed everybody's trust. Wow. I, he knew all along he was writing a book, and so I suspect. Mm -hmm. I think it's true. And so he wound up slamming mystery too. He yeah. said he loved them, but he also was attacking, uh, you know, talking about mysteries, issues with bipolar and craziness. And it just, he, he betrayed everybody in that sense. And Neil, my personal take on Neil is he likes betraying people. Mm. He gets off on that. It's his thing. And now people are going to put Ross slam Neil Strauss. Ross, blah, blah. well, you asked me what I thought. <clears throat> I acknowledged him as someone who told the truth about me to an extent. And I'll say he's a superb writer yeah he is writer yeah. yeah okay so i think this is a good place to stop do you have any other topics you want to cover while we're at it huh i will say this to anyone who's watching this if you want to hate on me hate on me i'm not going to read the comments on this draw yourself up short for a minute and ask wait a minute Ross has said some things that have made me deeply uncomfortable. Maybe it's in discomfort where there's some truth. Maybe it's the very things that I recoil at, rebel at, that I need to hear because they're so contrary to what I'm used to thinking. It's the ways of thinking, feeling, and acting that stand so far outside of what we're used to, of what we're comfortable with, that hold the potential, the potential, listen to me, to bring us results and a new kind of life far beyond what we've been used to living and enjoying. So if I've made you angry, if I've pissed you off, maybe inside of that reaction is an opportunity for you to pull yourself up short and go, all right, I think this is about Ross, blah, 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 blah. But maybe, maybe one of the reasons why I'm pissed off or uncomfortable is he's saying something I don't want to hear. And what I don't want to hear is exactly the thing I need to hear. Yeah. 
I, I tell my audience too. But that will fall on, I'm sorry, Jerry, that yeah. will fall on deaf ears. Yeah. It will be so good. But um, I second what you say. And what I tell my audience is this, whenever you hear a point that let's say it hits you something, take a second or maybe take a few seconds and think about it first before you react. A lot of times when I do chats with my audience, I sometimes bring them in in live hangouts. I tell them, before you interrupt someone, let them finish and think about it first. And you know, most of my audience doesn't do that, but I always try to emphasize to them, pause, think before you react. So that's something I would say, and that's just another way of phrasing what you're saying. Most people are not capable of doing that. The only way I've learned to do that is through a meditation practice. Yeah. And meditation's awesome. I try to do it. I, I, I'm one of those really inconsistent meditators. So Me something, something I've been doing is something I haven't told my audience yet, but I've been going to church recently. So church is like my way of meditating now because it forces you for an hour or two hours to be in an environment where you, know, you turn off your electronics, you do everything. And I do an hour a day phone fast. I turn mm -hmm. my phone off an hour. We could get into religion uh, off the air because uh, yeah. I'm an atheist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. We can definitely talk about it. So there's two topics. We'll, let's definitely talk about off there. We can talk about um, religion. We can talk about the other topic too. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. You know what? Next time I'm in LA, I'm here like every other week to see my family who I adore. We'll make arrangements to meet. I usually stay in Beverly Hills. Okay. Uh, and we'll we'll meet half. What do you do for a living, sir? Um. So I have another big channel where I do fight commentary. So I do jujitsu. So if you saw my Facebook, Gracie. No, um, I do Cobrinha. So he's, I mean, all jiu-jitsu basically stems from Gracie, but his line's a little different. But Cobrinha jiu-jitsu's in um, the West Hollywood Miracle Mile area. And so I go to his place twice or three times a week. Huh. And so that's my other channel. I have an interest in martial arts too. If I had to learn one thing to, to where I really needed to protect my life, it would be Krav Maga. Mm-hmm. Because the Israelis don't fuck around. Krav Maga is you're killing the person or or permanently crippling them in the first five seconds. Mm -hmm. And we can definitely talk about Krav Maga off air because there's a lot of bullshito in Krav Maga too. You got to be careful. I'm talking about the real stuff that they actually use in combat in Israeli, mm -hmm. not the commercial water. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's go off there and talk. Dude, yeah, guys, this was Ross Jeffries, the father, the papa, whatever, of PUA. And grab my book, Subtle Words That Sell. Definitely. I'll put all the links in the description. Yeah. Forget everything else. Don't link to my seduction stuff. Just link to that book on Amazon. Sure. All right, guys, let's thank Ross Jeffries. Leave your comments below. And, dude, I'll meet up with Ross sometime, and maybe I can bring him back. So thank you, Ross. My pleasure.